supervisor. Uh, okay. So let me just give some, some motivation and background for what I'll be talking about. Uh, of course, for this, uh, for this for you guys is gonna be like super obvious. Uh, and I'm gonna be uh, like, you know, be very hand wavy or very loose about things. So yeah, it's just to, to give some motivation. If you wanna also interrupt me, add, add some comment or anything uh, that you might consider, please go ahead. Uh, so first, uh, so I mean, we know that we have all these uh, quantum quantum uh, technologies trying to to to, uh, to give us a quantum computer, uh, like soon. Uh, and well, the, some of the basic ingredients that these quantum devices should have is that, uh, or that they should aim for, is to be general purpose, accurate, and scalable, right? Now, and now we know that currently, at least uh, yeah, at this stage, noise and errors are the things that are kind of keeping us um, from from continuing. Even if all, the, all of the other are uh, also have their own set, present their own set of problems, noise is currently the one that is uh, kind of the worst. Now uh, we know that noise means uh, well, noise. Uh, Means deviation from some ideal statistics that you would get in your in your experiment, and we can think of this as getting some ideal samples and then sending them through uh, a noisy classical channel. Um, even though physical physically this is not what happens, and yeah, there can be many different types of errors and sources of errors. Uh, but we know that we have, like, despite having this uh, overwhelming presence of noise, we know that we have this fault tolerant. Uh, fault tolerance theorem that tells us, uh, uh, well, it's a sufficient or give us sufficient conditions to compute reliably and indefinitely. Uh, essentially, if we have errors below a certain threshold, some uh, small probability epsilon, and if the correlations between errors are sufficiently weak, then we can uh, do computations uh, reliably with low overhead. Uh, so even though the theorem is give, gives sufficient conditions, I mean, these are kind of necessary as well. Uh, and we know that that uh, if we want to achieve this or we want to get below this fault tolerant uh, threshold, we know that we cannot just uh, get some quantum devices out of the shell. We kind of have to go through this process of, of uh, constructing them, uh, which uh, can be captured nicely by this um, diagram by Stefania, uh, sorry, uh, which is essentially is a process of, well, prioritizing uh, the kinds of errors that you wanna, that you wanna look at, or the kinds of processes that you wanna, that you wanna look at, measuring things, then fixing uh, whatever problems you're getting, verifying that you're doing things right, and then going all over again through this process. And eventually you're getting better and better. And uh, yeah, eventually at least that's the idea that we should uh, get below the fault tolerance, uh, the fault tolerance uh, threshold. And more generally, we can say that, well, we need precise characterization of, of our quantum devices and control of them. Uh, now, uh, 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 the, the technique that has become the gold standard, we like to say it, uh, uh, well, we have said it this way in, in our papers, in the previous papers, is randomized benchmarking. Uh, and now in this slide, I'm stressing to begin this process because of course, randomized benchmarking as uh, all of you may know, is not, it's far from perfect. And there are many better, uh, well, many more fine grained techniques uh, to do this. But randomized benchmarking, the, the, main, uh, the main advantage that, we, that it has uh, is that it, estimates average error rates with very little resources. Okay, so it's very economical. It's a very economical technique. Uh, and in principle, it's insensitive to state preparation and measurement errors. So you only are benchmarking the, the gates uh, that you're interested in. And it gives high confidence in the sense that uh, the variance that you get in your results is gonna be relatively small. Uh, and also you might already know that, well, randomized benchmarking compares, for example, on the other extreme with uh, full, full tomography in the sense that, well, even if it gives you very uh, 
uh, not that much information. It only tells you average, about average error rates of, of gate sets or even of individual gates. Uh, but it requires very little, very little resources. Whereas, for example, doing full tomography, well, scales exponentially, right? The, the amount of resources that you need scales exponentially. Now, within, within uh, randomized benchmarking, we know that we have, so uh, I think I said it before, but it's been over a decade already that randomized benchmarking has been around. So, uh, yeah, we have uh, a bunch of, uh, a whole set of, of different techniques. Uh, all of them to achieve different purposes or to benchmark different types of gate sets. Uh, and we have a very comprehensive uh, picture of, of this uh, framework, or, or we can give a kind of general framework of randomized benchmarking, which is nicely captured in this, in this paper. I think it's called precisely a general framework of randomized benchmarking. Uh, so yeah, you can do uh, things very tailored to, to very specific purposes within the, the technique of RB. Now, uh, all of this is, is, is all nice and good um, and, in very, and in a lot of generality, but always, uh, like even if, if a lot of these techniques don't say it explicitly, they start, they all start, or almost all of them start by assuming Markovianity. Uh, and even more, if you assume, if they assume time independence and gate independence, so of the errors, uh, things become at least uh, simple analytically. Uh, whereas if you start even thinking about the correlating errors in time, so, so considering non-Markovianity, I'm gonna explain by the way, uh, more precisely what, what all these terms mean. But whenever you start assuming non-Markovianity, well, considering non-Markovianity or more general dependence in the context, uh, within the errors, then things just, yeah, all chaos breaks loose, uh, basically. Okay, so so now I'm, I'm gonna start getting into details. So what is the idea with randomized benchmarking? Even if you're already aware of, of it, I'm gonna tell you just the standard idea, well, for the standard protocol. Uh, the idea is that, well, you sample uh, a, a number of gates and, uh, of gate GI uniformly at random from some given gate set, uh, such that you, so the gate sets uh, should be such that uh, you can construct these inverse. There are some protocols nowadays that get rid of this requirement of the inverse, uh, but I'm just giving you the standard uh, picture where you can, you assume that you can compute these inverse. So the sequence of inverses of all of the gates that you applied. And now, ideally, this would amount to an identity, right? So you wouldn't be doing anything. Uh, however, that is not the case. So uh, the, the kind of more most naive uh, way to model what is happening is to just attach some, some, some CPTP map to your gates and say, well, I'm applying my, my ideal map, and then I'm getting some unwanted uh, CPTP map, which you can say, well, this, this, this map amounts for the noise, okay? So uh, you, you, can, you can then run this circuit and just estimate uh, uh, probabilities with some PVM element, M. And then you can just repeat these many, many times and get some statistics uh, for the average uh, of, this, of, this, uh, of these probabilities, which we, we usually refer to to as average sequence fidelity, because then it turns out that you can relate these quantities. So these, these probabilities, uh, well, these average probabilities to, to gate fidelities of the, of the gates, to average gate fidelities of the gate. Uh, so now one, once you did that, then you examine, well, uh, or you check how, how this average uh, sequence fidelity changes in, in the sequence length. So, when you start changing the amount of gates that you're applying, then you just examine, well, how this, uh, this average sequence fidelity behaves. Uh, now, it, even if it's a, a kind of folklore claim, or well, it perhaps used to be, at least when I started working on this, on this topic, it seemed to be a folklore claim that uh, randomized benchmarking, the statistics of randomized benchmarking is always a decaying exponential. 
so that this ASF be, behaves as an exponential. Uh, however, that, that is not always the case. So it is the case whenever you assume, uh, so Clifford gates, uh, or that your gates form a unitary to design. Uh, yeah, if you don't know about what is that, uh, yeah, that it's okay. So you just assume some special kind of, of gate set. And if you assume things about the noise, so if you assume that, that your noise is Markovian, so that, that it acts locally in time, just as I said, uh, that, it, that we model it before, and that you assume that, well, the noise doesn't depend on which gate you applied, and it doesn't depend on when you applied it, the gates, then that is when you get uh, an exponential decay. And uh, so, I mean, it's very nice because then you can analytically evaluate the average of, of that sequence of gates, of noisy gates, and then you get some profile for the ASF, which looks like this. So where this P is just some parameter between zero and one, uh, and it, it it relates to it to the average gate fidelity of lambda. So so that uh, parameter P captures the average gate fidelity of, of the noise. Now explicitly, the, the, the expressions look like this. So this uh, P parameter contains this, uh, this average gate fidelity F in here. Uh, this D is just the dimension that you would be considering. Usually for randomized benchmarking, we just think of, of uh, a single qubit. Uh, there are also plot protocols for multi-qubit systems, but usually it's very simplistic scenarios because there are many other complications that come along. Uh, uh, and uh, A and B, so they just capture uh, the, the spam errors, so the state preparation measurement errors. Uh, and, and you can see uh, now why randomized benchmarking is, is said to be in principle to be insensitive to, to spam errors, because these, these spam errors end up just being some constant in the, in the decay. Okay, uh, so yeah, this is just the expression, uh, the explicit expression for the average gate fidelity. Uh, and now this, this can be, so, so assuming uh, just Markovianity, this can be generalized uh, quite a bit. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the, the thing that I said about Clifford gates or unitary to designs, uh, that can also be relaxed uh, uh, by now quite a bit. So, and, and one particular case that we are interested or that we got interested in is uh, in this work was the case of, of gate sets that form a group. Uh, and that is relevant because then, uh, so there is this result, uh, which is a consequence of Schur's lemma, where essentially uh, uh, for any finite group uh, such that you can decompose it in this way, so, such that you can decompose the representation uh, of this finite group uh, in this way, where these, these are uh, irreducible uh, sub-representations of your group. So this pi is just uh, some label for the reducible representations of the group. Whenever you can you can decompose uh, your your uh, representation in this way, then this map uh, that I'm uh, representing here as T, which we call the twirl, which is kind of a, 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 the analog of an average over some representation of, of your gates. Uh, then it takes this, this simple form just as a consequence of this lemma called Schur's lemma. Uh, so it takes a very simple form, this twirl of, of any linear map. Uh, so it's just, it's just some sum on, on these factors, okay? And it only depends on these projectors on the support of the irreducible uh, sub representations of your representation. Okay, so, so in the end, the point is that you can do averages over any finite group relatively easily. Okay, and then, so so how can we apply this to, to randomized benchmarking? Well, you can just use the super, super operator representation of, of your channels. Uh, so your gates, you just can represent them as matrices. Uh, so here I'm just uh, denoting this vector vectorize, vectorization map uh, by this uh, double ket. So this would be for states, but this implies that then channels can be represented as matrices acting on vectors. 
Uh, and then you can just apply Schur's lemma in this uh, super operator representation of, of your channels. Okay. And that implies, so, so once, you, once you do that and you say, well, my gates are now, um, my gate sets form a group, then you can just apply Schur's lemma and, and see that the decay of your average sequence fidelity takes the form of, of a linear combination of exponentials. Okay, so now these F uh, are kind of analogs of the P that I showed you before that contain the average gate fidelity. Now these these Fs are the analogs, but they they are they don't contain always the, the average gate fidelity, but they contain some information about the quality of your gates. Okay, so so in the in the case of Clifford group or of unitary to design, you just get two two kind of sectors. So one is if if uh, everything goes uh, fine, like there is no no errors. Okay, so it sends you to the to the trivial subrepresentation, or if you get uh, if you go to, to the other subspace and that the P parameter quantifies how much you're getting, uh, like how much your noise is, is, is uh, not harming you or sending you to the other um, sub-representation. Whereas in, in this case, you can have many subspaces and that's why we have several quality parameters. Okay, so the interpretation is not, is not quite as, as straightforward as in the case of Clifford group. Uh, but still, you can you can think of this as quantifying the quality of your gates, okay? And now they, they take this this kind of form, which is a generalized form of the P that I showed you before that contained the the average gate fidelity, okay? So if you consider the the Clifford group, then all of these uh, these formulas reduce to the to the P that I showed you before, and these A pi's reduce to A and B, okay? The the ones that contain the spam. Uh, errors. Okay, now uh, even more like uh, if we also relax some assumptions about the noise, so we can relax already. So time dependence, I think uh, I, I didn't include it in the in the um, explicitly in in these slides. But you can rely you you can relax the time dependence the time independence assumptions. So say you can think that that the noise will depend on when you apply to your gates. Okay, and you can also get the decay profile, uh, the analytical decay profile easily. And even more, you can relax as well the decay dependence uh, assumption. And uh, we now know uh, that 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 you would get so so whenever your gate dependence is not uh, very strong, we know that that the the effect that it will have is just to add some some. Uh, some decay parameter that itself decays exponentially in sequence length. Okay, so uh, also by the way, I, I'm used to my my own notation, but if you forget about any of the any of the the symbols that I'm using, so m in here represents the sequence length. Okay, so the number of gates that that you apply in the sequence. So yeah, just in, interrupt me if you uh, get lost with any of the symbols. Uh, but yeah, when 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 you consider the noise to be gate dependent, then uh, yeah, we now know that that, that when it's not super, uh, the gate dependence is not super high, then you just get some correction of this form. Okay. Now, wh what is the deal with with uh, non-Markovianity? Uh, so so as I told you, you can relax time time dependence uh, and gate dependence. Now. With, with all of that within Markovianity, but once you start relaxing Markovianity, yeah, it becomes very problematic. Now, uh, when I'm saying non-Markovianity, uh, yeah, the, the this idea in at least in quantum stochastic processes, the the idea of non-Markovianity has been somewhat contentious because when you start considering correlations, uh, yeah, things become quite troublesome. It's not as easy as in the classical case. But generally, the, the main idea is the same as in the classical case. Okay, so it just means that, that you would have some memory about what happened, so some kind of dependence in the past. Okay, now, just, just to remind you from, from classical uh, stochastic processes what it means. Well, Markovianity means that if you have probabilities, so suppose you have some classical stochastic, uh, classical random uh, variable, 
classical stochastic process. Uh, and then you say, well, what is the probability that I get some out outcome X of K at some time step K, uh, depending on the previous probabilities? Well, if your process is Markovian, then this, uh, this conditional probability on all the previous ones will in reality just depend on the previous uh, step. Okay, so that is what, what a, a Markovian process means. Now, just also to give you an idea of why uh, Markovian things are much easier than non-Markovian ones, is well, you, you can consider the definition of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of these uh, 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 probabilities, conditional probabilities, in terms of joint probabilities. And then you can see that, well, if you consider a K point joint probability, if you put the mark of uh, the mark of uh, condition in there, then you can see that k point joint probabilities will only depend on two point probabilities. Okay, so you only need two point correlations to describe joint probabilities or arbitrary number of steps. Whereas in the non-Markovian case, you really need all of the k point correlations. Okay, so so. Yeah, that gives you a, an idea of the complexity that, that one has to deal with when, when things are, are non-Markovian. And also, I, I want to stress that non-Markovianity really means multi-time processes. So you cannot just consider two-point uh, correlations to, to really talk about non-Markovianity. Even if you can flag uh, non-Markovianity, so, so you can spot their methods, methods to detect non-Markovianity, to really characterize non-Markovian process, you need to go beyond two-point correlation. Okay, and that is the that's why I was saying that it's a bit contentious uh, still, because the traditional approach in in open quantum systems is that you consider you kind of track quantum systems in time, and then you measure at some point, and you just consider two-point correlations. Okay, and that is problematic because yeah, just for the reasons that I tried to give you before. Uh, now, also, whenever we think about non-Markovianity is, well, how do you model these correlations? Or how do you, like, what is mediating the correlations? Well, you usually think of some environment, some external environment mediating, so serving as a kind of memory, okay, and keeping track of what, what happened in the past, okay, and at some point, that information coming back. Now, uh, yes, I was saying, well, this traditional approach has to be turned multi-time in some way. Uh, and that is problematic in quantum uh, mechanics because as you know, well, when you measure, you are already messing up with your system. And yeah, things become very problematic. Traditionally, they're having problems. Even when you consider correlated initial states, uh, if you try to deal with, with quantum dynamics in the usual way, then you start getting up all sorts of uh, problematic things. Okay. And now the, the, the way that we know we can resolve things now is to change this, this uh, like fundamentally the approach that we are taking in open quantum systems. Instead of thinking, well, that we have access to actual quantum states, we, we really just have access to the experimental manipulations that we can do, right? So we can just describe, well, how do we transform the, or, or how the things that the, the maps that we apply, so the quantum channels or the CPTP maps that we apply, how do they give us uh, future quantum states? Okay, and, and for this, we have already this, this uh, process tensor framework, which is the one that I'm, I'm gonna be uh, talking about uh, in here. Uh, and this, this, this uh, table is just to show you that, that we have a rigorous uh, you know, language for this, which I'm not gonna be talking about in detail in this talk, but it's just to let you know that, yeah, we have the formal uh, approach, the formal framework already set. Okay, and to give you an idea of what, how how it works, is well you you can you can um, uh, describe things as this quantum circuit. Okay, so suppose you have a closed system composed of environment of some external environment and your uh, system of of interest. So this E and E and this S, then you can apply um, a quantum channels, so completely positive at least uh, maps AI and trace non-increasing maps, A1, A2, and so on. And in the, in the meanwhile, so, so between your applications of these quantum channels, 
you would have some unitary dynamics uh, in the whole system and environment, okay? And in the end, you measure, yeah, you do some measurement. And this, this will give you the full statistics, so a kind of, a, well, a generalized born rule. Okay, so this will give you the joint statistics of the whole process. And now, what I was telling you that 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 um, the idea behind this this process tensor approach is that well, now you can think of not having access to to the dynamics uh, to the underlying dynamics, nor to the initial quantum state, which can be correlated, right? You you don't know, uh, but you can think of that thing uh, just taking the operations that you're that you're applying. Okay, you're applying these operations. And then there is some multilinear map, so some higher order map, giving you this final state at time step k. Okay, now, uh, yeah, this has been studied by now quite thoroughly. Uh, and uh, it's a bit interesting that people have come up with this kind of framework for different purposes. Uh, in open quantum systems, we know it as process tensor or process matrix as well when, when you deal with things having to do with causality. Uh, but in different, in other, uh, in other areas, people know it by different names, which is slightly unfortunate, but uh, yeah, it's the same basic object, okay? So it's a, it's some, some uh, map acting on maps. So it's like a super, super map, okay? It's a, it's a map taking quantum channels or quantum maps and giving you uh, quantum states. Okay, and now this, this uh, makes things, uh, like conceptually easier because then you can just think of doing contraction of of, uh, of this comb like structure so you can pile up your operations in all also in a in a in a process tensor kind of kind of object okay so in a comb in a comb like of object uh, which you can also then include correlations in your operations right and then you can just do contraction of these two tensors and you get your your outputs at some time step k. Now I'm saying choice states, but then you can represent them however you want. The point is that you contract them and you get some output state. Uh, okay, and that, that this is also nice. So this framework uh, is also nice because it gives you a neat uh, Markov Markov condition, which also relies on checking dependence on 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 the past. Uh, by doing measurements and preparing fresh sets of states, and then you check, well, if things actually depend on the past or not. So this is, um, you can see this, this operational Markov condition, which is similar to the ones, to the classical one that I showed before. Uh, yeah, you can look at it in detail in, in this paper. But in the end, what it implies is that Markovian processes can be written in this uh, tensor product form. So, so you basically can just, uh, have local applications of, of, of quantum states, and that would give you your, your of quantum channel, sorry, uh, which would be the underlying dynamics, and that gives you a Markov process, so basically something that is local in time. Okay, and then you can also measure non-Markovianity just with any uh, distance measure, any relevant distance measure between quantum processes. So, so you can just take your process and then measure how far it is from the closest Markovian process in, in your space of quantum processes. And that will give you a, 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 an operational, a relevant measure of non-Markovianity. Okay, now uh, for randomized benchmarking, of course, then we can just uh, directly turn this, this Markovian kind of uh, scenario into something that looks like this, okay? So now this environment is the one mediating the, the correlation. So, so you would have this lambda two would depend on what this lambda one was before through the environment and so on, right? So the, the environment kind of keeps track of this, this, uh, this memory. Okay, and now we can just turn the, the original randomized benchmarking sequence into something like this. So we just, the only difference is that we have the environment acting trivially here, but these lambda i's, um, so the noise maps, the ones that we thought previously that in the in the process tensor framework we think of as the dynamics that you don't have access to, now is the noise, okay? 
uh, and now it's acting jointly on system and environment. Okay, and then you can just contract things uh, and average over these, uh, over your quantum gates. And then that will give you the average sequence fidelity. Okay, uh, so now before turning to, 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 our, uh, to our actual results, all of this was uh, just background, uh, but yeah, some shameless uh, advertising for, for Kavan and Simon's paper. So this tutorial, because yeah, th this topic of, of non-Markovianity is very, very long and there are many details that I'm uh, not, not talking about here, but you can have a look at this tutorial, which is, uh, yeah, it's very neat. Uh, I can recommend it, even if it's also quite long, uh, but yeah, you can look at detail here. Okay, so now uh, I come to talk about uh, our results. Now, the, the, the first thing that, that we can notice is that, well, we can, we can uh, uh, extend this trail. So the, the kind of averaging that I told you before, we can extend it to act solely on subsystem S instead of acting on, instead of averaging whole, uh, whole maps, we can just average on, on your small subsystem. Uh, and the way that we can do this, so I mean, you can just introduce some, some so this is the, the, super operator form, the super operator form of this noise map, okay? So this, it's the vectorized or the ma matrix form of the, of, the, of the noise maps, okay? So then you can just introduce some, some, uh, some, some, uh, some basis of the environment, and then you can just rewrite things in this way. Okay, so this would be the environment part, and this would be the system part, uh, and then you can just take the the average on on subsystem S solely. Okay, and then the twirl instead of instead of getting the the form that I showed you before, which was just F times P. Okay, so some some uh, scalar factor times these projectors P. Now you get some operator. Uh, tensor product with these uh, projectors. Okay, so these projectors are on system and these, these uh, Q uh, operators are on environment. Okay, and this, uh, just as in the, in, the, in, the, in the case that I showed you for, for the whole twirl, uh, the Fs before uh, had the information about what you have average. In this case, these operators Q are the ones that capture uh, the information about what you are twirling, what you are averaging. Okay, so now instead of getting quality factors, you can think of this as quality operators or quality maps. Okay, uh, so now you you can just apply this averaging to the whole uh, randomized benchmarking sequence and average. Okay, uh, and then you you just get something that looks like this. Okay. So now, uh, in, in the in the Markovian case, you would get f times p. So so p would still be within this this uh, this uh, this expectation value, okay? And you just you would just get the f. So instead of having this q in here, you would just get an f, and you can just take it out, okay? And that gives you the the exponential factor. But now in this case, well, you get an operator in 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 like sandwiched in here. Okay, and it looks sort of ugly. So if you write it down mathematically, it looks something like this, which looks kind of awful. But if you really think about it, this 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 guy really just looks like something like this. So if you're familiar with the tensor uh, tensor networks, so it just looks like some matrix product operator uh, being contracted with with a with this tensor product of, of uh, projectors. Okay, so you just uh, contract the legs in this way. Uh, and then uh, um, you would have these, these double bars would be the environment. Okay, so it's actually a kind of a nice object or a kind of simple object. It just looks uh, complex, but it, it's not really that, that bad, okay? And now, well, first, so, so that that was our first result. So we can we can evaluate the average sequence fidelity for this uh, for these finite groups uh, in the non-Markovian case, and then we can check that well if you assume that that you have Markovianity, so that you 
the environment is redundant. You, you don't get anything traveling from step to step. Okay, then things reduce to the usual to the usual uh, to the usual objects that we know. Okay, so this quality parameter. So in the time dependent case, you just get a product of, of uh, quality parameters, and in the time independent case, you get this exponential uh, of the quality parameters. And uh, yeah, the average sequence fidelity just looks like this. Okay, so the the spam factors are just these guys. So it's the guys that I wrote before as a pi, a sub pi. Um, yeah, it's just this this factor, okay. And of course, the in the Markovian case, the noise acts solely on on the system. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, for the Clifford group. So this is just to, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's fine. You you guys probably are, but for the Clifford group, uh, you can compute these these projectors explicitly. So they look something like this, or they're just related to this to this guy. Um, yeah, you can compute things uh, explicitly, and you uh, recover the original single exponential decay. Okay. Uh, in the paper, this is detailed. Uh, yeah, uh, kind of thoroughly. Now, in the non-Markovian case with the Clifford group, so we studied this uh, in this in this PRX quantum. Uh, in this paper, uh, and you get some kind of similar uh, decay now with with maps A and B. So instead of getting some constants, then you get a couple of of maps acting solely on on the environment. Uh, and this is just an example that we came up with uh, for two qubits. So one qubit, thinking of it as as being the environment, and the other one as being your system, and having some noise. Uh, with some interaction like this, which is, yeah, it's just kind of fictitious. We just wanted to see, well, uh, what, what happens when, when you uh, evaluate this, this, uh, this formula. And then if you look at the numerics, then, well, you get these points uh, in here, like falling into the analytical prediction. And you can actually see these deviations from, from the exponential that would look like this. Okay, now the the lastly the, the case that we consider for this uh, for this average sequence fidelity with with finite groups and non-Markovianity is well, what if you just have non-Markovianity uh, with a with a small probability? So if you have see if almost all of your noise is acting locally uh, on on the subsystem, but then you have some finite amount of, of non-Markovianity. So uh, yeah, if you can then model noise. So the lambda uh, uh, the lambda maps, you can model them uh, with some probability to be, or well, as this convex combination of, of some noise gamma acting on the whole system and environment. And uh, with one minus Q probability, this, this uh, acting solely on subsystem S. Okay, so this map phi acting solely on subsystem S. Then you can you can get this kind of uh, expansion, uh, which is not strictly a, a, an expansion, uh, well, a, a perturbative expansion, but it's it's an, a perturbative expansion whenever this Q is very, very small. You can get this kind of expansion, uh, so this kind of expansion around the, around the Markovian average sequence fidelity. Okay, and then uh, you get these these contributions with finite noise, uh, which are are written in here. Again, yeah, uh, don't don't try to focus much on the on the details, but uh, it's just it's just uh, terms that consider non-Markovianity within a finite number of steps. Okay, so so maps acting on system and environment for a finite number of steps, and then becoming uh, becoming Markovian, so becoming solely acting on system okay you, you can just yeah expand things in this way uh now okay th this is all uh good uh, we can describe things analytically and so on but then th the point of, of randomized benchmarking is precisely that you can extract average gate fidelities very easily just by fitting exponentials right so now the the, the question is still well how do you actually get an extract you know what what uh, yeah like gate fidelities about this these processes right now 
the thing that we, the, the idea that we came up with is, well, how about do you think about your randomized benchmarking process just as some single, some single maps, some single box, right? So it contains uh, the whole average sequence, well, the whole uh, randomized benchmarking already average process in there and it contains the, the quality maps in there. Uh, how can you break or how can you get access to this box? Uh, and well, this is one way that we figured out, well, you can just average. So, I mean, the, the things that you can still like turn around are this, uh, the initial state and, and the measurement. So then you can just average over these two. Okay, so this is just one example of how you could average. So say you pick some unitary, and then you average over some, some target the initial states. And then you can consider that, well, you get noise uh, after you, you, you acted with this, with this unitary. And then your measurement, like you, you, can, you can pick some basis, okay, for your measurements. Then you can apply the same unitary. You can think of that you get some noise. Then you can average. Uh, uh, so you can do many, many runs with this, with this, uh, with, different sample, uniformly sampled unitaries, then you average, right? And that basically, just by definition, it, it gives you the average gate fidelity of this F, so of this, uh, of this map, okay? Uh, so yeah, this is what I was saying. Uh, essentially, when you do that kind of averaging, you, you get the average of, of this guy, okay? Some sum over all of the possible subspaces uh, up from your representation of your gates. Okay, so that essentially, yeah, gives you an average gate fidelity of this guy. Uh, and then the, the constants just depend on how you pick your target state and your, uh, your, your basis vector for your measurement, for your random measurement. Okay, now, so some points to, to clarify when, when you do this as well. Now, uh, this, this gate fidelity is a gate fidelity of the whole randomized benchmarking process, okay? Which is uh, slightly different. Well, it's different from the usual Markovian case because in the Markovian case, you can look at, uh, well, depending if it's time independent, then you get the, the, the average gate fidelity for the single noise that would be the same across the whole process, but you can also get gate fidelities for uh, arbitrary sequence lengths. Which you, you cannot do that in here. Like you, you have to consider really all of the process, okay? But that is a feature of non-Markovianity because precisely, yeah, you cannot isolate just uh, particular steps. You you have to consider the whole process, okay? Now uh, the thing is, well, you can also look at um, each uh, subspace, uh, so, so each sub representation of of your group by this technique called character RV. Uh, which, well, uh, yeah, if you're interested, you can look at, at this paper, but yeah, th there is a technique that lets you look at these uh, irreducible subspaces individually called character RV. Uh, now, another thing to mention is, well, yeah, this dependence that I told you with, with how you choose your target states and bases. Uh, and furthermore, like, so in here, in this in this F, uh, we are also considering these these maps N and M, which would contain spam errors. Okay, so so when you have non-Markovian errors, the spam actually becomes uh, relevant. So it's not like in the Markovian case that uh, you can just uh, separate it from the noise in your gates. Uh, I mean, here it becomes relevant precisely because the environment can. So so whenever you have the spam errors being correlated between system and environment, then those errors can hit you in the end still. Okay, so, so now uh, when you get this average gate fidelity of this F uh, map, then you can still try to separate the, the spam errors from the errors in the quality maps uh, by using this inequality. Okay. Uh, yeah, we didn't explore this further, but at least there is uh, yeah, some room to, to try to, you know, differentiate between those kinds of errors. Okay, and well, yeah, finally to point out that obviously in the, in the Markovian case, if you were to average over uh, 
initial states and measurements, they'll then yeah, that, that would be redundant. Uh, and you would just get some some expression of this kind where you just look at average spam errors, or, or that would be the, the kind of extra information that you could look at. Um, okay, so now uh, uh, now as I as I was saying, well, you don't have this modularity property in the non-Markovian case. Okay, and what I'm meaning uh, with these modularities, you cannot do this kind of stuff of taking ratios of uh, quality maps, okay? Because precisely these quality maps depend on the whole sequence, okay? In the Markovian case, you can take ratios of, of quality parameters. So suppose you have some process of length n and some process, some randomized benchmarking process of length m. Then if you take the ratio, you just get uh, the the interval between m plus one and n, okay, of these uh, quality parameters. But in the non-Markovian case, you cannot really do that, okay. Now this this implies so so already Flamia and uh, Joe Wallman in in a, a paper called Randomized Benchmarking with Confidence they already discussed this. Uh, but if you see th this implies that if you see increases in the in the in the average sequence fidelity so if you get if you get some decay and all of the sudden you get a spike so you get the average sequence fidelity increasing then that 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 is not possible within a markovian uh, randomized benchmarking uh, sequence okay precisely because the this quality parameters so so the p in the usual single exponential or these f's uh, cannot be greater than one okay and that is just a consequence of that uh, so then that got us to wonder, well, if we have already this framework, well, what can we say, you know, if we look at these conditions? So for some uh, bigger sequence length, how, uh, what can we deduce if we see some increase, okay, within this non-Markovian framework? Uh, and the result that we look, that we got is, well, is this sufficient condition? Is that uh, so? The difference between the n quality parameter and the m quality parameter would need to be positive, semi-definite, and that is kind of uh, is kind of obvious, and it doesn't tell us much. Uh, but then, so this necessary condition was a bit uh, surprising because so it tells us that that you need uh, for these these noise maps on the whole system and environment to increase the so 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 this is this is a largest singular value. So these double bars, it's operator norm or largest singular value. Now you can interpret uh, the 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 operator norm of a super operator uh, map as as how much this map increases the purity uh, of your state at, at yeah when you apply the the map on the channel. Okay, so then. This means that that the product of of your your uh, noise maps on the whole system and environment has to increase the purity by at least the s square. Uh, yeah, it's how in, it increases the purity as a square. Uh, yeah, that's a small technical detail, but the point is that it has to increase the the, the purity, okay, by at least the size of the of the system the square. Uh, okay, and then so so. Just to tell you how this condition follows, it just follows by this this uh, inequality uh, for positive x and y, and and this other inequality, which is just uh, an inequality for uh, for uh, like marginal states. You can think of or reduced uh, operator. Um, then yeah, as I said, well, this is slightly well. It's nice because it tells us that that. The, the noise has to be such that the purity of the intermediate states increases. Uh, and that already discards unitary noise, for example. Okay, and uh, well, you can even uh, like uh, fine grain this a little bit more, this inequality by looking at this, this condition on, on this, uh, this operator norm, that it has to be less, less or equal than this, uh, than the square root of the dimension of the environment and of the dimension of your system. And then it implies that you have, for example, if you only have an increase from step n from to step n plus one, 
that means that that noise has to, uh, that the noise, uh, uh, that, that the size of, of the environment for that noise has to be at least uh, of the size of your system, okay? Uh, if you have a bunch sequence of, of noise uh, and then you notice an increase, then that means that the product of all of those, uh, the dimension of the environment between all of those has to be at least the size of the, of the system, okay? Um, then, okay, finally, so yeah, this is the, the last thing that we, we wanted to look at uh, when we just came up with this, this expression uh, for the average sequence fidelity is, well, what happens with gate dependence? So I mean, gate dependence in a way is a kind of non-Markovianity. So we were just wondering, well, how uh, can we extend this, this type of result that, that tells you that you can just add some, some some uh, kind of perturbation term to your sequence fidelity. And uh, well, as I said, yeah, gate dependence is a form of non-Markovianity. Well, it turns out you, you, cannot, you cannot really do that uh, to extend this, this expression uh, from the Markovian case. But anyway, what, what you can do is at least, well, what we could do, what we were able to show is that at least there, there are some stability bounds. So, if, the, if, if you really just perturb uh, a tiny little bit with gate dependence, then the, the form of the non-Markovian sequence uh, fidelity wouldn't change that much. Now, the, the, the really the other problem is, well, how do you distinguish uh, non-Markovianity and gate dependence? Uh, and that is, yeah, it's still an open question uh, that we thought about, but we didn't really got much farther. Um, okay, so so just to wrap up a little bit, uh, some general points that I that I would like to make is well, non-Markovianity is challenging in in general. Uh, it's it, it's yeah very complex, and uh, there are many sort of things to to consider. Uh, there is a need in in particular to to address this this uh, non-Markovian phenomena in, in quantum characterization. Uh, even more as, as we start going for, for more and more qubits and uh, bigger depths in, in our circuits, uh, yeah, we really need to, to think about ways of, of uh, dealing with non-Markovianity or in general context dependence or temporal dependent noise. Uh, and yeah, basically what, what we try and do uh, was to, to generalize this randomized benchmarking, uh, the standard uh, randomized benchmarking framework for non-Markovian noise, uh, of course, it yeah, it th there's still much to be done uh, to extend things and to tailor for for specific randomized benchmarking uh, 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 types of of, of uh, protocols. Now, uh, yeah, in the near future, things that that we could do is well think about context dependence and yeah, this. Uh, thing that I that I talked about with with gate dependence, then tailoring for a specific purpose and actually looking at tiny, uh, well not not tiny but uh, but more specific problems. So for example, with the gates, uh, with the multi qubit systems, for example, uh, or for different randomized benchmarking uh, protocols. Uh, okay, and also characterizing this, well, what happens with the noise with these quality maps for these more specific cases. Uh, of course, the usage of naive na native uh, gate sets instead of groups, which groups it's still, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, well, not not so, so practical uh, to look at yet. So yeah. Uh, and then how to incorporate other time dependence such as drift. So we are considering non-Markovianity just at the gate level, but not at the level of several circuits, okay? So then, well, yeah, how can we incorporate this kind of non-Markovianity as well? So, I mean, further questions, well, would be how can we mitigate non-Markovianity? And also if we can use non-Markovianity as a resource, uh, as I tell you, like non-Markovianity can actually increase this, this sequence fidelity. It's not clear if, for example, the actual gate fidelities or 
you could use it to to actually um, mitigate the the noise itself, or you know, do something else with it. So yeah, these are just um, more general questions that are not really very well posed yet, uh, but that you could think about in any case. Uh, so yeah, just finally, just some advertisement. Um, I'm quite in time, so right on time. Uh, so yeah, we have available positions uh, at, at Taipei. So you can just contact uh, Min Xu, who is the leader, the director here at, at Foxconn. Uh, and also we would be happy to, to listen to your, to your results, to, uh, to any talk that you would like to give uh, at our group seminar. So you can just send me an email and yeah, we would be happy to have you. So yeah, thanks again uh, for having me. So, um, hi, I'm Francesco. Hi. I'm, um, is there any question? I have some, but if anyone has questions before, um, I would give priority. Okay, in the meantime, um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you and kind of, uh, had, uh, had a comment about it was noise mitigation. And uh, yeah, I would like to ask you, um, let's say if you can say a bit more of what you think can be uh, done in this uh, framework. And the second question would be, what do you think it's possible to really learn about the uh, the map that is uh, giving this non-Markovian noise? So if you want is still a part of how, to, how do I mitigate the noise? First, I need to know how to properly learn the map that is uh, uh, causing the Markovian noise. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, let, let me just, so with the mitigation aspect, so there are already ways, for example, of doing uh, so dynamical decoupling. Uh, there was recently a paper also, so with Kavan as the leader, but there are also others involved doing dynamical decoupling, using it uh, in a way as a resource uh, to mitigate noise. Uh, so yeah, there are approaches. Dynamical decoupling is the one that I know of uh, the most when when you consider non-Markovianity. Uh, but yeah, I mean, from from our perspective, it's just yeah that that it it should be possible in some way to use that information that is coming back uh, to hit you to actually mitigate uh, the noise to learn something about the the profile of the noise and then to be able to mitigate it. Uh, but yeah, it's not it's not super clear right now. I just know that people, yeah, at least with dynamical decoupling, uh, I think there has been some good progress uh, in this direction of mitigating actually the noise. Uh, and the second question, uh, what was that? Sorry. Yeah, it was. Let's say, how do you think we so? or how far can we go in learning the, the let's say, noisy map that is affecting the system and environment in the sense of, can we go beyond these, uh, let's say, quality factor that we learn from the yeah. randomized benchmarking or can we really uh, learn more uh, like, uh, yeah, the quantum operators that are coupling uh, system and environment and coefficients and so on. Yeah, I think it would, would be possible. I mean, this is for uh, randomized benchmarking only, uh, but uh, if, if the process tensor framework uh, is, is applied in other techniques, there might be some, some chances to doing something there, like to get more information about the noise. In this case, it only tells you about averages. So, I mean, it's not super, super clear how much information, uh, yeah, you could, you could get there other than just averages. Um, 
there are some ways, for example, that we're thinking about now, like with this particular case of randomized benchmarking of applying machine learning techniques, because it turns out that you can model these process tensors as matrix product operators. Uh, so then you can apply machine learning techniques for tensor networks uh, and try to do something so without, for example, in the in the plot that I showed, we have to assume some model uh, to do to do this plot. So in this plot, we just have to assume some model and then study what happens to the to the average uh, sequence fidelity. So so that is the uh, kind of the biggest problem that uh, that we have right now. That to say something about this quality map, uh, we have to put some model or you know something else. Uh, so yeah, one way is that with machine learning techniques, uh, but the other would be yeah, just to look at the other uh, characterization methods with the process tensor to try and incorporate uh, non-Markovianity with the process tensor in other uh, characterization techniques. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Felix, you thanks, want Marcus. to... Yeah, uh, so I had a I had sort of a related question, I guess. Uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, so one um, one thing I guess that comes to mind is like the question of um, sort of suppressing the non-Markovianity. Uh, I don't know how how useful that is if you want to actually measure the non-Markovianity, but like so for example with leakage. Um, you know, we have some work, and I think there's there's maybe even similar work from other people like uh, Emerson and, and Co. about um, essentially adding randomization, you know, on the sort of computational subspace um, in order yeah. to sort of suppress that that um, coherence that you would build up, essentially, which is what the non-Markovianity non is, right, um, to, to yeah. the leakage channel. So have you guys thought about that sort of stuff for... Like, I don't know whether there's any, like, even use to combining that kind of stuff with what, like, with your measurements, essentially. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, we haven't thought about specific kinds of errors. For example, yeah, as you, as you say, leakage or um, crosstalk is the other one that I know that is kind of uh, pervasive, uh, where non-Markovianity can be actually relevant. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't thought yet uh, directly about mitigation. Uh, but definitely, yeah, it, that would be also a relevant uh, thing to look at. As I said, the dynamical decoupling is the one that I can think would be kind of more direct yeah. uh, to, to work with. Uh, and in there, the idea is that you try to Markovianize the process. So you kind of try to yeah just decouple the Yeah, the but that's exactly the same thing. I mean, adding adding random phases and, and like yeah. Yeah, 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 dynamical yeah. decoupling is the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But then, like, I'm just, I guess, rather than than saying like mitigating the noise, like you actually want the noise, right? Because you want to be able to measure it. So I guess the question is like, yeah. if you can get a version of the of the RB that doesn't have the noise versus with the noise, maybe that's a helpful way to to separate the non Markovianity, or can you already do that essentially from your process matrix? Ah, right? uh, I'm not sure I understand the. The, the question, question is, can you can you already sort of separate um, how much of the error that you measure at the end is non-Markovian versus Markovian error? Oh, okay. So I mean, the the way that we that we can detect non-Markovianity in randomized benchmarking is just uh, you go and do the experiment, and then you get the decay profile, and if you get deviations from exponential, then that's so. Uh, almost certainly a flag for non-Markovianity. Mm -hmm. It can also be, for example, uh, yeah, just an, a certain type of time dependence or something that just alters the rate of decay. Uh, but if you get kind of bumps in, in, your, in, in the decay profile, then almost always that, that flags to non-Markovianity. Now, the so for example, in, in the PRX paper, what we have is, kind of methods to uh, to analyze the data that you get. How can you separate, for example, finite non-Markovianity if you get, because usually you would get only finite amount of non-Markovianity, so the correlations would be kind of short-lived. And then there are ways that, that you can actually realize 
uh, how long this this noise is being being uh, the correlations are being relevant. And also, you can, for example, we can detect if, if the the type of error that you're getting in the full system and environment is coherent. So if it's unitary on the whole system and environment, or if you're getting some dissipation. Okay. Uh, now this is still, so for example, in that paper, it's still a bit elaborated on how to do that. And you also have to assume, or yeah, you have to assume that you can propose a model for the noise and then try to analyze that and so on. So yeah, there is still uh, a way to go in how to actually extract some model of the of the noise or get some knowledge of the noise and then do these kinds of uh, more fine grain techniques to do something about yeah how long the non markovianity is lasting or if your non markovian noise is coherent or incoherent and so on um but yeah there's still a long way yeah but there's okay there's a lot of uh, work in that direction okay thank you very much yeah thank you very much Yes, okay, so if we do not have any further question, I think we can thank our speaker again uh, for the nice, in, uh, let's say, talk about uh, Numarkovian uh, randomized benchmarking and uh, yeah, hope to see you again, uh, maybe thank in your you, yeah. group. So. Thank you, thanks a lot. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.